What's up, future respiratory therapists? Hey, we got a good topic for you here today. We're talking about minute ventilation versus alveolar minute ventilation. What's the difference? Why does it matter? And how you can use it to be a better respiratory therapist? Let's dive in. All right, so as I stated today, we're talking all about minute ventilation versus alveolar minute ventilation. Let me show you how we're gonna do this. We have a, a set of lungs here, and what we need to do is understand that, if you've watched any of my other videos, you know that I talk a lot about minute ventilation. I think minute ventilation is key. I think understanding the minute ventilation formula is perhaps, perhaps, the most important formula that you need to understand as a respiratory therapist. And we know that that formula is VE equals respiratory rate times tidal volume. Now, that all makes sense, right? He's like, okay, well, we got that part. So what we're really talking about now when we start talking about alveolar VE, right? This is VE alveolar. Well, what is that? Well, what it is is it's respiratory rate times tidal volume minus dead space ran out of room there but you follow me right so, you know what let's just start over here how about that okay so let's just say minute ventilation ve equals respiratory rate times tidal volume we know that alveolar ve or alveolar minute ventilation equals respiratory rate times tidal volume but you have to subtract dead space. That's, that's what you need to know, okay? So, but let's talk about what that means because what we're gonna soon learn here is that all minute ventilation is not the same. So I'm just gonna throw some numbers up here. I have, uh, this isn't pre-planned, so I'm just gonna hope this all works out. Let's just say you have a person with a respiratory rate of 20 and a tidal volume of 300. Okay, that sounds good. That gives us a VE of six liters, 20 times 300 is 6,000 milliliters. We turn milliliters into liters and we see we have six liters, okay? Now, we're gonna do the exact same thing, but we're gonna come over here and say that we have a person with a respiratory rate of 12 and a tidal volume of 500 milliliters, and guess what? That gives us a minute ventilation of six liters, 6,000 milliliters translated in the six liters, okay? Now, it's important that we talk about how these are different, and this is where alveolar minute ventilation becomes an important concept, and what that means is that we have to ask ourselves, okay, what we have to realize is that of these two tidal volumes here, we have to understand that every single time we take a breath in, there is volume of gas. There's a volume of gas that does not participate with gas exchange. What does that mean? It means that when I inhale this oxygen molecule out here, that oxygen molecule is in my mouth right now or in my nose, my oral, my nasal pharynx, right? There's no pulmonary blood flow in my oral nasal pharynx. And so that is areas where gas has moved, but it's not going... To, to pick up any oxygen because there's no pulmonary blood flow. So the definition of dead space, which is what we're talking about here, is the areas where you have ventilation in excess or the absence of pulmonary perfusion. That means we're talking about our oral and nasal pharynx. We're also talking about all of our conducting airways. Now, when you look at the lungs here, the lungs are where the pulmonary units are, the alveoli. This is the functional units. There's blood flow all out through here. There's not pulmonary blood flow within our trachea and our, and our, and our left and right main stem and all of our conducting airways. That's dead space, meaning there's air coming in and there's air in those areas, but it's not participating in gas exchange because there's no blood flow to those areas for that type of gas exchange to happen. And so how do we know how much dead space a person has? Well, it's simple. We just simply have to calculate their ideal body weight in pounds. So we're very good at getting it into kilograms. We're not always so good at getting it into pounds. So let's just say that we have a person who is 68 kilos. 
So this is 68 kilograms. If we multiply that times 2.2, because we know one kilogram equals 2.2 pounds, then we realize that we can do 68 times 2.2, and it gives us 149.6. So we're going to say approximately 150 pounds. Now, this is important because that 150 pounds represents your amount of dead space. Remember this, your ideal body weight in pounds, for every one pound of ideal body weight, you have approximately one ml of anatomical dead space. So that means that we're going to lose 150 milliliters of every single breath inside of these airways here. So, for this patient over here, on this side, they breathe in 300, 300 goes in, but we lose 150 throughout all of this in the upper airways. We lose 150. So, if we lose 150 mLs, then that means that of this 300, only 150 milliliters makes its way to the functional units of the pulmonary system the alveoli, the, 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 the functional pulmonary units. We see that only 150 mLs gets there. Now we do the same thing over here. Remember, we put in 500. 500 went in. And again, we lose 150. So if you do 500 minus 150, you see where we get 350 mLs that make it into this patient's pulmonary units or alveoli. Now, how does this matter? What we do is we label this, okay? Because 150 is dead space. This is alveolar tidal volume. This is alveolar tidal volume. So now all we have to do is go, okay, well, if that's our alveolar tidal volume, then we multiply alveolar tidal volume times respiratory rate, and you'll get alveolar minute ventilation. See how that works? Alveolar tidal volume times respiratory rate will give you alveolar minute ventilation. So it looks like this. Now, what we do here is we do 20 times 0.15, or 20 times 150 is, uh, I believe, 3,000. So that's going to be 3 liters. Okay, so this is actually of the total 6 liters that was moved in and out of the pulmonary system. Only three liters of that actually participated with gas exchange, which makes sense because it's exactly half, and 150 mLs of dead space is exactly half of our tidal volume. Right? Now let's do it over here. We take 350, we multiply it times 12. So we go 12 times 350, that gives us 4,200. So this is 4.2. Two liters. So here's the point I'm trying to drive home. Both of these patients had a minute ventilation of six liters per minute. In the base level, when we said respiratory rate times tidal volume, they had the exact same minute ventilation. But because this person had a larger tidal volume, then it means that that dead space affects this patient less. So in the grand scheme of things, this patient over here has a higher alveolar minute ventilation than this person here. 4.2 versus 3. This person, 6 liters per minute, is going to be more effective at moving and re removing CO2 than this person's is over here. And that's how dead space works. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing when you start realizing that, you know what? Minute ventilation is very, very important, but it's not the end game because minute ventilations can be identical, but breathing patterns can change it. What this tells me is that tidal volume and effective tidal volume carries more weight than a respiratory rate. 100%. That's exactly what it says. You can do this with any set of numbers, and the person with the more effective tidal volume is going to have a higher alveolar minute ventilation, considering everything else is equal from a total minute ventilation standpoint.
Now, I'm not saying respiratory rate doesn't matter because we know it does, but you see the difference. This person needs to take a more effective tidal volume. We get that rate down, we get that volume up, and they'll have more effectiveness at the alveolar level because it will offset that, 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 that anatomical dead space that we see right there. Now, I told you down here, minute ventilation equals respiratory rate times tidal volume. That's still true. Here, alveolar minute ventilation equals respiratory rate times tidal volume minus dead space. That's what we did. Tidal volume minus dead space equals 350 times rate equals 4.2. We did the same thing over here. 300 minus 150 equals 150 times 20 equals 3 liters. But you can also say this another way because you know we have those instructors who like to throw, throw curveballs to us. And, and we need to be ready for another way we may see this formula. So instead of saying alveolar minute ventilation equals respiratory rate times tidal volume minus dead space, remember what we called this. We called this alveolar tidal volume. So we could say alveolar minute ventilation equals respiratory rate times alveolar tidal volume. Fun stuff, fun, fun stuff. Now, I've been talking about dead space a lot, and it would be uh, remiss of me to not talk about a couple of different ways you might hear dead space talked about. So, there's three primary different types of dead spaces. There is one anatomical, which is what we just talked about. So, if I was going to shade anatomical dead space, if I was going to call this is anatomical, it's probably important for us to realize that all of the airways, this is the anatomical dead space, okay? Now, if we go into it and we start talking about um, alveolar dead space. Now, see, this is different because alveolar dead space is going to bring us down to these regions here. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, we didn't talk about alveolar dead space on the previous slide. Well, we didn't because I was just trying to illustrate to you the impact of anatomical dead space on alveolar minute ventilation. But when we think about alveolar dead space, what we start realizing is that patients with, say, emphysema have an increased alveolar dead space. They have more ventilation than they do perfusion, and that leads to an increase in alveolar dead space. We also know that if you have a patient who has a pulmonary embolism and there is no blood flow moving past this alveoli, then this is all wasted ventilation here, aka dead space. And so we understand that when we talk about alveolar dead space, that's what we're talking about. Now, funny thing is, put these two together, and this is physiologic dead space. So physiologic dead space is uh, what we're talking about right here, page 242 out of Egan's. It says the sum, the sum of anatomic and alveolar dead space is called physiologic dead space. That came out of Egan's, okay? And so we realize if we put these two together, we'll see what our total dead space is from our anatomical and our alveolar dead space. And then we have this last one here that, that we have to, we have to, to, to talk about. And this last one is uh, what we call mechanical dead space, okay? And sometimes, according to Egan's, this is also referred to as instrumental dead space. Here's what Egan says. In a patient on mechanical ventilation, the dead space can, increase, can be increased by equipment. Things like HMEs, heat moisture exchangers, things like connectors, tubing, suction catheters, entitled CO2 monitoring or monitors, things like that. Placed where? Where does it happen? Between the ventilator circuit and the endotracheal tube. What does that refer to? That refers to this space right here. Anything that you put between the end of the endotracheal tube and the circuit Y, anything that goes in here is going to increase your mechanical dead space. And you have to know that. I had a patient one time come back from surgery, they were having a hard time ventilating them, and they had put a really long um, uh, flex tubing between the patient's uh, Y 
and their tracheostomy tube because they were trying not to put too much torque or pull or strain on a tracheostomy tube. It wasn't the wrong move, but what they did and what ended up happening was, was that excessive flex tubing that was now put between here and here increased the mechanical dead space and put more workload on the patient. It basically ate into the tidal volume that was being delivered to the patient, which decreased alveolar ventilation, caused CO2 to rise, and that's, that's the game we're playing. That's dead space, anatomical, alveolar, mechanical. You gotta understand the difference between minute ventilation and alveolar minute ventilation. Remember this, I'll leave you with this also. Minute ventilation will always be higher than alveolar minute ventilation because we always have to subtract out dead space. We always have to. There's always some amount of dead space and we have to take a for it. Here we go, respiratory coach. Um, on various different platforms. You're already here on YouTube. Do me a favor, like this video, subscribe, and hit the like button or hit the uh, bell notification so you see when my next video is posted. Come follow me on Instagram at Respiratory Coach, TikTok at Respiratory Coach, and then over here on LinkedIn at Joe Lewis. If you're an RT student right now, go make you a LinkedIn profile right now and start making professional connections with the other people in this world that are in the RT space that will help you achieve your dreams to being whatever it is you want to do and what you want to be in the world of respiratory therapy. Always send me an email, respiratorycoach at gmail.com. I would love to converse with you um, in a different setting. You can send me any questions you might have, any concerns, send them to that email right there. Remember at the end of the day, you get the honor to take care of sick people during their most vulnerable times. That requires an expert. Be that expert. And remember, average is easy. Don't be it.